Hello! Today's video is on carbohydrates, especially focused for healthcare students. My website, sciencewithsusanna.com, has this blank drawing to accompany the video as well as practice materials to quiz yourself. Carbohydrates are biomolecules that always contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Polysaccharides are built from monosaccharides, also known as macromolecules, organic molecules, there are a total of three popular names for polymers of carbohydrates. So polymers in living things include carbohydrates, which is the subject of today's video, as well as lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. The monomers or building blocks of large carbohydrate molecules are the monosaccharide simple sugars, most notably glucose, which I've drawn here. In the watery environment of the body, Sugars form into ring structures. Simple sugars have the formula C6H12O6. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So this is glucose. Dextrose is the term used for glucose in its purified form that's administered in IVs or other medical settings. The two other main six carbon monosaccharides are fructose and galactose. Ribose and deoxyribose are the five carbon sugars in the sugar phosphate backbone of nucleic acids, but they are rarely discussed when talking about carbohydrate roles in the body. Disaccharides are two simple sugars put together, usually making the formula C12H22O11. The pattern of two to one hydrogens to oxygen is typical. Here is glucose, bonded to a fructose to make sucrose, or what you know as table sugar. Lactose, milk sugar, and maltose are the two other well-known disaccharides. And now onto the polysaccharides, the very large biomolecules that are built with many, many simple sugars. Plant starch is digestible by us. Using the enzyme amylase, which is made by our pancreas and our salivary glands, amylase breaks down complex carbohydrates such as starch into many individual molecules of glucose. This occurs in the intestine, and then these glucose molecules are absorbed into the bloodstream. Potatoes and grains are well-known examples of starches. Animals store their carbohydrates as long branching chains called glycogen. We can store only limited quantities of glycogen in our liver and our muscle cells. Plant cellulose is a highly structured polysaccharide, that makes up plant cell walls. This is completely indigestible for us. Only animals that contain certain kinds of stomachs and bacterial populations are able to extract any calories from cellulose. We call these types of animals herbivores. Cellulose provides us as humans with insoluble dietary fiber. Other indigestible fiber parts of a plant that are more soluble in water include pectin and the gums of certain plants. Next up, peptidoglycan which is actually a combination of carbohydrate and proteins. It makes up bacterial cell walls. Protein crosslinks hold together many layers of simple sugars. Students study this fascinating cell wall structure when they take microbiology. Gram-negative bacteria have relatively thin peptidoglycan layers and stain pink, whereas gram-positive bacteria will stain a lovely purple because of their thick peptidoglycan layers. Now, Let's consider simple sugar in the body. Glucose is what we measure when we test for blood glucose or blood sugar. The ideal range in the blood remains quite steady even between meals in healthy people. But as people lose metabolic flexibility or become pre-diabetic, they may vary more and more widely from the ideal range of between 70 and 120 milligrams per deciliter even after eating Hyperglycemia literally means too much sugar in the blood. It is most commonly seen when people damage their metabolism and begin to develop type 2 diabetes. Hypoglycemia is the opposite problem, not enough sugar in the blood. It is most commonly seen in diabetics that inject more insulin than they needed to cover the food they ate. As we'll see in a moment, insulin lowers blood sugar. Normoglycemia means normal amounts of sugar in the blood. Now, in order for the polar glucose molecules to pass through the cell membranes and enter cells, the protein hormone called insulin binds to insulin receptors on cells. 
These receptors then stimulate glucose channels to be inserted into the cell membrane. The polar glucose molecules can then passively enter the cells through these glucose channels, moving down their concentration gradient. Insulin allows glucose to enter cells. Thus, insulin decreases blood sugar. Once inside the cell, glucose is further broken down in the cytoplasm in the process of glycolysis into two three-carbon molecules called pyruvate. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria, where complete breakdown of the carbon molecules is finished with many enzymatic reactions of the citric acid cycle. The electron transport chain on the inner mitochondrial membrane then generates ATP energy for cellular activities. Glucose is therefore a key source of ATP production for many cells. Glycoproteins are really neat molecules that are part protein and part sugar. They serve to identify a cell as part of you or not. Think of them as ID tags. An antigen is the name we give to glycoproteins that provoke an immune response. For example, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 is a glycoprotein. The liver monitors blood glucose levels in the blood. Glucose is absorbed from the intestine and then it immediately enters the liver through the hepatic portal vein. The liver allows just the right amount, ideally about 100 milligrams per deciliter, to exit the liver and return to the circulation through the hepatic vein. The liver modifies carbohydrates by storing or releasing glucose in order to keep blood sugar steady. If excess glucose was in the meal, then the liver stores the excess glucose as glycogen in a process that is called glycogenesis. Whenever you see gen or genesis on a term, it means to maybe build something or make something new. Once the liver is filled with as much glycogen as it can hold, the liver must store additional excess glucose and all excess fructose as triglycerides. We call this lipogenesis. Once the liver stores too much fat, inflammation can begin in the liver, leading to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease a disease that was virtually unheard of 50 years ago, but has become very common. In between meals, glycogen stores can be broken down via glycogenolysis, releasing glucose into the blood so hypoglycemia doesn't occur. Given enough hours between meals, the liver can also start breaking down triglycerides by performing lipolysis. The liver is even capable of building new glucose molecules from amino acids in a process called gluconeogenesis. Now, spend a few minutes reviewing this information, make sure you understand it reasonably well, and then use my Quizlet flashcards to practice and review. See you in the next video!